right, so first I'm going to show you a just an illustration of raising a number to a large power. Um, I briefly explained at the end last time why you should expect this to be something you can do quickly. Now I'm just going to show you that in fact it is something that a pro computer program can do very quickly. Um, this is a very unconvincing example, but just to see what it's doing, it computes a number to another power modulo something else. So in this case that's 8, but reduced modulo 5 is just 3. That's the remainder of quantum division by 5. Uh, but now we can put bigger numbers in here. Uh, like that, that's the modulus. Uh, don't put this at the beginning. So here, the exponent is very big. The modulus is pretty big. And you can again see it takes no time. I mean, pretty much anything you could possibly type in here, it'll just say 0, 0.0. You would have to type thousands and thousands and thousands of digits to get to ever go beyond 0, 0.00 in time. Um, so then we can make the base big as well make the exponent a little bit bigger. It's just whatever you do, it's just instantaneous. Uh, it's kind of hard to type a big number in there because I did this layout thing. So let me, I'm just going to rearrange the interact a little. So now you can type bigger numbers. Woohoo! So, hey, but notice that it stopped detecting. I just figured out how to trigger a bug in the type setting, unfortunately, but it shouldn't um, mess up the lecture. Actually, it will mess up the lecture. So yeah, it got it crashed uh, typesetting math when I was repeatedly doing it over and over again, which is pretty annoying. And I think the only way to fix that is to refresh the browser, unfortunately. So that's what I shall do. Um, but I will fix this problem. Ooh, still broken. Huh. That's really annoying. It's still broken. Shouldn't be. Okay, that fixed it. So in any case, I can type in a big number, a very, very big exponent, and some sort of big modulus. I broke the math type setting again. <laughs> okay, I'll just get rid of the math type setting. I don't know. Well, anyways, you know what happened. So you can see that um, that number to the power of that other number is this, and it takes no time at all. So you can very, very quickly compute large powers. And just to remind you again why this is the case, um, you can read very detailed explanation of this in the book. But what this is doing behind the scenes, modulo some small optimizations, is it takes this exponent right here, b, and it writes that number in binary. So it writes it as a sum of powers of 2. And then it takes a, and it just squares a repeatedly. It takes a and squares it, reduces the result mod n. Then it takes that result and, re and squares it again. And then it squares that again. And it just does this like a, a few hundred times, which doesn't take very long. And it gets a whole bunch of uh, perfect two power powers of a. Basically it computes a, a squared, a to the fourth, a to the eighth, a to the sixteenth, a to the thirty-second, etc. Then it uses very basic algebra to observe that a to the power of b is exactly the same as a product of a certain subset of these a to the powers of two powers. Boom, it very efficiently gets the result. Uh, right here. Okay? So you understand the basic idea there. And of course there are, you can certainly imagine lots of the tricks that you might apply to make this a little bit better. For example, instead of just straight writing B in binary, you might somehow write it as a quotient of two numbers in binary. So some powers of two divided by some other powers of two. Maybe the number of powers of two involved would be less. And so you could cut down on how many multiplications you have to do. So there's a lot of little tricks like that. Um, in fact, the analog of this process, a uh, certain optimization of the analog of this process on an elliptic curve is called Koblitz exponentiation, named after Neil Koblitz, who's a number theorist in our department. And if you go to Kristen Lauder's office at Microsoft, um, she's the head of the cryptography research group there. There's a, um, as with many people at Microsoft, there's a pyramid of cubes, one with a pat each one has a patent on it, and one of them says Koblitz exponentiation on it. So, um, strangely, Kristen Lauder over across the lake has a patent on Neil Kolwitz's exponentiation. <laughs> Guess that's how it works. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about Diffie-Hellman, which is 
a pretty cool idea. So basically for, I don't know, however long there are people, for many, 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 many thousands of years, the way you would send a secret message was uh, ugly and tricky and hard to explain. And um, there are lots of ways, like you would handcuff a briefcase to somebody's hand, or you'd shave somebody's head and tattoo something on their head and then let their hair grow out, or you would build some really complicated machine called Enigma, etc. There were a huge number of approaches to sending a secret message over the years. And then suddenly, uh, these two guys, Diffie and Hellman, came up with an absolutely fundamental, groundbreaking idea, which is a different approach to sending secret messages, which uh, has been very revolutionary. And there are many ideas that come out of this, but it's the first example of a publicly known public key crypto system. GCHQ in England, uh, maybe slightly earlier, came up with something similar to this, but they kept it secret and didn't do anything with it at all. So, uh, so they don't get the credit. So I want to show you the um, Math Signet review. So there's something called Math Signet, which you can um, you have to pay a subscription to get access, but from anywhere on campus, you get free access to all their content. And what it has is for almost every math paper that's ever been written, it has a summary that you can actually understand, uh, unlike the paper itself usually. It has a summary that describes it. It's like a review of the paper explaining what the main result or main ideas of the paper are. Um, it doesn't have like star rankings or anything, but it's a good way of finding. The, I mean, the good thing about having the, the review is they're searchable. So since until recently you couldn't search the actual text of papers, this is often the main way to find papers on a topic. Uh, okay, so here is the, a screenshot of the math signet review of the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange paper, which was published in 1976. I won't read the whole thing to you, but um, it's interesting because it's extremely dubious. So the author suggests, and then they have like, have like in quotes, public key distribution system, but then most interestingly, it has, they propose a couple of techniques to implement this, but the reviewer was unconvinced, which means the reviewer doesn't buy it, doesn't think it's really a plausible idea. And you'll find this occasionally with papers that are published where the reviewer will say, this theorem is just wrong, you know, or something, or I don't believe this, or whatever. Um, this one isn't quite saying the theorem's wrong, but it's saying that there are some issues. Um, and then there's also <coughs> concerns. So this is the first paper, and now I'm going to explain to you what their thing is, the thing that the reviewer is unconvinced by. What is their idea? Okay. So we're going to do two things. So first, I'm going to uh, use the whiteboard to explain just the sort of background theoretically of how this works. And then we'll do an actual example of it with numbers of real size. OK? Um, can, let's see. So I'll start with a bit of theory. Blink. Okay, hopefully that will work. So the goal, so you have two people, they can communicate over some sort of um, communications channel, and they want to um, exchange messages that are encrypted somehow. And so the one thing that we're going to solve mathematically um, subject to certain hypotheses that no one has ever proved are true. So there's that problem. But if you believe they're true for a moment, and so far they seem to be, we'll be able to solve a certain problem, which will allow us to um, communicate or communicate a shared secret. So basically this is a number theorist's approach to the following sort of thing, like let's suppose there's, there's somebody in the room that I know really well from high school, let's say. Um, I might like, you know, do something back and forth with them and kind of make some hints and we could agree on the name of one of our friends with neither of us saying that name. And then we could use that name that we each know and everybody watching us doesn't know even though they saw everything we did. We could use that name to somehow encrypt messages back and forth. I'm not going to say how, but we might do something like what if we had to send a really short message? We could just change the each letter of our message by the corresponding letter in that name, something like that, something silly, but that would work if we had to send a very short message. So this is a mathematical analog of that, but it's far more powerful in that it doesn't require having 
had to go to high school with somebody uh, or having any shared prior knowledge with that person, okay? And it's really, really basic math based on what you've learned already in the course. So here's the idea. What you do is step one, agree on a prime number, on a large prime. So me and somebody else in the class Publicly, in front of everybody, we'll say, we agree on, we're going to use this prime. And then we'll just say, our prime will be, I don't know, 2 to the power of 127 minus 1. I don't even know if that's prime, but something like that. It's probably not prime, but we agree on a large prime somehow. And you have to do some work to figure out what large should mean. Um, and you'll see what it means momentarily. Then what we'll do um, is, so there's two sides to this. Right, publicly agree on a large prime. And then on this side, I will generate a random number. I'll just call it uh, M. And what I'll do is just kind of secretly, I'll compute, let's see this prime's P, I'll compute 2 to the power of M modulo p. So I will compute this. Certainly, uh, this is possible. So I might generate my random number m by sitting there and rolling a dice a whole bunch of times to get each digit of my number. I mean, something like that, OK? So it's possible I could do this. Uh, and then you know now that raising a number to a large power mod another number is really easy, even if these numbers have hundreds of digits, OK? So it's fairly easy using modern computers to do this. The other person is going to do exactly the same thing. They're going to compute some number t prime, which is 2 to the power of some other number, I'll just call it n, mod p. So n equals random. Does somebody here have a laptop with them and open it working? Actually, yours is open and working right there. What's your name? Matt. Matt. Okay, so you'll be Matt. And I'm over here. All right, so Matt generates a random number on his laptop or something over there. He computes this. You know, on his laptop, he doesn't let anybody see what he's doing when he uh, chooses his n. But t prime, he computes, and he just tells everybody what t prime is. So t prime gets sent this way. Similarly, I tell everybody what my t is. In particular, Matt hears it. OK, so now at this point, I know a secret number m. Matt knows a secret number n, and everybody who's watching us, everybody else in this room, knows both t prime and t. But you guys don't know easily m or n. Because in order to find them, you'd have to do something. Like, you'd have to do some work. You'd have to solve some problem. It's not obvious what n and m are. OK? And now we're almost done. Here's the secret that Matt and I will agree on. The secret is equal to, I take my number, I take the number t prime that Matt just told me and I raise it to the power of my secret number m mod p. And the result is 2 to the power of m times n mod p. So this is a calculation I can do because Matt told me what t prime is. On the other hand, Matt knows what t is, so Matt can compute is he can compute t to the power of n mod p because he knows t to the power he knows t and he knows n. Um, so let's see, t prime was two to the n. This is to the power of m. And what Matt computed is my t is really two to the m, but it's raised to the power of n mod p. So we've just computed in two different ways a number modulo p. But the funny thing is those two numbers are exactly the same. They're both equal to 2 to the mn. Despite the fact that neither, so I don't know the secret number n. Matt doesn't know the secret number m. But we both know a single number modulo p. And none of you do. Unless you were to somehow figure out what m is or what n is by some incredibly time-consuming procedure. That's the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. The only slight modification is you might want to restrict your prime 
so that 2 has a multiplicative order p minus 1 modulo p. Or you might want to replace 2 by something else. Or you can, in fact, do the entire thing, but in a different group, instead of the group of integers modulo, uh, non-zero integers modulo p. But this is it. Uh, and this is used, if you ever used SSH on a computer to connect to a remote computer, it uses exactly this, um, with specific choices of parameters. Okay, any questions? And one of the main things that makes this viable is just um, being able to do the calculation of 2 to the power of m mod p quickly. Um, so a lot of people out there in the world who probably have no idea that you can do this efficiently, so they wouldn't know how to implement this. But once you know that, it's not really that hard. Um, another issue that's actually a big deal is how do you choose this random number? Uh, that's something that's really, really easy to mess up when you try to implement this in practice. Yes? So SSH, SSH, you just use it as a key for this yeah. cipher Yes, exactly. So use this to agree on a, a shared secret. Once you have a shared secret, there's a whole bunch of different, uh, there's a whole suite of different algorithms that you might use for encrypting messages back and forth. Um, I think my personal favorite is AES128. Right? That's an extremely popular one. Uh, but there are many things you can do. Just to give you the most basic idea of what you might do, if you have a, say the secret is a 200 digit number and you need to send a short message to somebody, just take, um, just take pairs of digits and use them to move, uh, set, like change your letters modulo 26 or something. I mean, it's really stupid, but it would be like, basically you can use your big number as a one-time pad to sh send a short message. There's much better things to do. I'm just giving you a really, really basic idea of what you can do. I'm not going to talk a lot about symmetric ciphers like the advanced encryption scheme or any of that, because it really doesn't involve very much number theory. Um, but yeah, once you share a secret, then you have, if you share a secret, then you can use that to do a lot of uh, other very fast, efficient, and secure communication. So, I mean, the main thing about this is it's just so simple, it doesn't seem possible that this could actually work. Uh, and the main thing you have to think about is that there isn't some really easy way to break this. That's, what, that's the part that's really hard. And absolutely incredibly massive amount of effort by uh, hundreds and hundreds and more of people have thought about ways of trying to break the system. You know, if you know 2 to the n, if you know t, because you saw me send it, and you know p, maybe you can just figure out what m is. In theory, you can, because you could just try m equals 1, m equals 2, m equals 3, m equals 4. At some point, eventually, if you had infinite time, you would get to the value of m, and you would know what m is. So there are algorithms like that, that is a finite, a well-defined finite sequence of steps that will give you m. Um, but these approaches are not fast enough. And I'll give you a homework problem for homework set 3, or several that involve just estimating how long it will take in years, or whatever, for, or lifetimes of the universe, I don't know. Is there an estimate of the lifetime of the universe? I don't believe those theories. Because, yeah, I know uh, either. It's we're BS. waiting for information that came to us a million years Okay, how about age of the universe? Again, the same thing. We okay, don't know what it. happened a million years all right. ago because the light just got here. Yeah, all right, never mind. What will happen tomorrow? But the universe probably isn't 10 to the 100 years old. So there. Um, in any case, how about the age of the, the Earth? That's closer. Uh, that's millions of years. Okay, good. Millions of years. So we'll, of years. we'll do something like estimating how long the calculation of m given 2 to the m and p and a specific algorithm would take in terms of uh, lifetimes of the, the Earth. How about in terms of lifetimes of you? So that because <laughs> if it's greater than one, then you're out of luck. Yes. <laughs> yep. Like. Matt was sitting there and he would like just randomly type letters on his key numbers on his keyboard or did something. So these are randomly generated in some manner. Um, and that can be a major weakness of these sorts of systems. In fact, uh, evidently the NSA put a backdoor in one of the random number generators that was being pushed pretty heavily. And uh, Dan Chameau, working at Microsoft Research, found it and told everybody about it. A lot of people didn't believe him, but now it's been it's part of the Snowden revelations. So, uh, yeah, people do sometimes mess up how the random number is chosen. Yes? Yes, so I know M, but I don't need to know N. 
So both of the people need to know one of the two numbers, but they don't need to know both of them. That's the key thing. So just uh, another comment? Nope. Let's just try it. And, oh, do you have a comment? A yes, I sure. That's right. There's nothing, I never ever know or need to know Matt's n. Okay? In fact, let's do it live. So this is in the shared project, Matt. And if you open the shared project, you should be able to open the worksheet for today. Okay. Okay. But also, um, open another worksheet. <coughs> in the shared? Yep. Just like maybe next to it or something. So we're going to uh, go through and exchange a secret. So we're doing it on time. Good. Yep. Well, anywhere you want. But what we're going to do is agree on a prime. So I'll turn the screen back on. We're going to agree on a prime. And then we'll each generate an n and an m. And then we're going to agree on a secret key. And they're going to hold up our laptops, and they'll be the same, even though everybody watched what we did. OK? Um, I hope. OK, so here's this demo. So what I'm going to do is, and anybody can do this. I've just, whoa. Kind of <laughs> so here is a nice, big, healthy looking prime. Um, we didn't have to generate it too cleverly. I mean, maybe it's a bad choice. I don't know. Um, you have to investigate ways of attacking the system in order to know whether or not a prime is a good choice. And we could talk about that later. But um, just to give you a sense of how the system works, let's just do it without worrying too much about very, very cleverly choosing the parameters to avoid all known attacks. OK? So I'm going to call this function set random c 0 so that the random number generator is seeded with the number 0. And now I'll make the prime be the next prime after some uh, random number with 512 bits. I could have made that even simpler by literally just taking the next prime after 2 to the 512. But uh, I just did it this way. So, OK, so that's the prime. We agree on it. Everyone can see it. Um, this is not so good, because you can see my number. So uh, I'm going to comment that out, and I'm also going to change the seed. So each time you call this, it uses a different seed. OK, so first I evaluate this. That's the prime that we're agreeing on. Next, there's now a secret number m right there. It's a big number. Just to give you a sense of it, for fun, I'll tell you the first three digits, let's say. So that's the Python way of getting the first few digits. It starts out with, uh, move this up. It starts out with, that's not the same m. So, or, that's OK. starts out with 50141. And it's some like really long number, OK? Let's see. Its length is it's a 154 digit number. It starts out at 50141. And now let's compute this t equals 2 to the power of m modulo p. That's the number. I don't have to keep this secret, because I'm going to tell everybody this number. The only thing that's secret at this point is the number m, which starts out with 50141, OK? Now, in order to do the next step of the protocol, to agree on a, sh a secret with somebody, they need to send me their t prime, or t0, and I need to paste it in right here. OK, and that person is going to be Matt. And I hope that, I think I've got it. OK, so you don't have to yell it out, because there's no way I'm going to type in 154 digits correctly. But you can just paste it into the chat. Every single document has a chat next to it, yeah, and you can toggle it using this. Take your time. So if you paste your 100 and whatever 50-ish digit number right there, um, then I will be able to paste it in as T0. I guess you could also literally just paste it right here, since you have access to this worksheet. Either way is fine. Do you want me to paste my N? No, your no, N is secret. I don't know your N. I never need to know your N. I don't want to know your N. No. So basically, you just do something just like I did with step three and get a big number. And then copy and paste it 
in here. Yes? Nope. Nope. So what I, we, the, the thing that we both know is the big prime number P. And then I, I don't actually even know it, but my computer knows M, which I just randomly generated, totally at random. And then I computed publicly for everyone to see 2 to the power of M. And hopefully he's computing his own random M and then computing 2 to the power of his random M. And then uh, he pasted it in right there. Okay? So I don't know his, I don't know what random number he uses to compute this. It would probably take me years to figure it out using the best known algorithms. But I'm going to take it and I'm going to paste it in right here. Meantime, he is going to paste in my T. Okay? So you can copy my T out. Um, I can put it right here. You can copy my T and put it into your worksheet. Okay? So now we know his T0, and we know our M, or I know my M, so I can now compute this. T0 to the power of M. Uh, it's very important to work modulo P, <laughs> as you may have discovered. So, and Matt, make sure, or make sure he does this. Uh, you want to compute T, the T to the power of M, but you want to do it mod P. If you don't put the mod P there, it's not gonna, it's gonna take a while, because the result will have a very large number of digits. Okay, so let's see what the shared secret is for us. Oops, there it is. Uh, that's the, that number right there. So this is a number that people watching, I, you wouldn't know if you didn't just see it here, um, that we agreed on. Okay? Yes? If you don't know the secret before his photo, you don't know the secret as in because there's something talking about secret. So you don't know why right computer. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, I do not understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know the photo, you don't know, doesn't know the secret. So yes. You don't know what, send, what are you sending to the other person. Imagine there was some like magic way that we could start out with knowing nothing in common and suddenly we just shout back and forth something to each other, anybody can hear us, and suddenly we both know a secret and nobody else knows it. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> so that's what this is. The secret is like the key. Like yeah. And it's kind of a weird secret. It's not like I know a secret that you don't know that has some meaning. It's a completely random secret that you generated. It's a shared bit of secret information. But it's not like it has any meaning in and of itself. Like its value is almost, it's just completely random. But you both know that random thing. Did it? So Matt, did you get a number? Yes, I'm going to enter it in chat. Okay, it's the same. Look. <laughs> so we we agreed on a secret. But people could watch us and if I hadn't actually printed it out, then you know, neither, no, you wouldn't have been able to figure it out. Like, what information did you have? You had T, and you had T0. That's it. And you had P. But you couldn't do this one step right here. So, that's right, you can't do this. <laughs> All right? So that's the problem. You can't do this. But I can. And so this is like the prototype for a lot of different... Um, Crypto systems. Uh, we'll do some more with this. I'm going to talk about the man in the middle in a second, which is an attack against this that's pretty disturbing um, and causes annoyance all the time. We'll talk about the RSA crypto system. And then in um, the Bitcoin, for Bitcoin transactions, it's good to understand how that works. And one of the key things is there's an elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. Elliptic curves, which I probably, I mentioned them many times and we'll do a lot with them in this course. Um, they provide a group that's very analogous to the group Z mod NZ star. It's just a little bit different, and it turns out to be um, much, much more efficient for implementing crypto systems. If you look at how hard it is to attack this problem as a function of P, uh, and then look at how hard it is to attack the analogous problem with sort of numbers having the same size for an elliptic curve, it just seems, based on how successful people have been, that elliptic curves are much, much harder to attack. And so they're used a lot. And in particular, the elliptic curve that's used in Bitcoin, it's what's called a Koblitz curve. Neil Koblitz again from here. And uh, it's a special curve for which things are even faster. Like a lot of arithmetic that is used in Bitcoin is much faster because of that use of curve. Um, and the digital signature algorithm they use is very, very closely related to Diffie-Hellman, as we'll see later.
It's called the ECDSA, Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. Yes? So remember you guys have a secret yes. amount of, like, something? Yes. Mm -hmm. You can so that's an extremely annoying property of this uh, setup that I've just explained to you. You can't do anything. As a third party, we've shared a secret with each other. You can't do anything whatever given the information we've computed with each other. So you can't encrypt anything to me. You can't decrypt anything to me. The only thing that's now enabled by us having set up this exchange is that Matt and I can send secret messages back and forth to each other, and you can't read them, but that's it. Um, there is another system called RSA, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, that addresses exactly your question. And it allows me to just publish once and for all some information, and then you can send me secret messages using that information. Yes? Could you do this process with more than two people, and then just like keep rotating around until everybody's... Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so you want to share the secret amongst three people. Uh, or you want to come up with a, sh a secret that is shared amongst three people. Uh, I don't know. I've never thought about that. I assume so. Let's see, how would that work? I mean, it would get complicated quickly. I mean, you could do something. You could just do it with two people at once, but then you end up sharing different secrets with the two people. Um, actually, I don't know. I do not know whether exactly this can solve that problem, but there certainly is a way to solve that problem. Hands, let's see, you answered something recently, so yeah, you can say something next. would work. Or, yeah, I mean, or even just basically what you said, like, if you can agree on a way to communicate secretly with one person and another, then you could just do those two things and then generate a random number and then share it with the two people and say that's your secret. So that's basically what you're saying, but more direct. And then you start worrying very much about exactly how much time it takes because typically these things get implemented um, like on a smart, on a phone or in a lot of places where like right when you visit a web browser, it might do something like this. It might in fact do exactly this in order to set up a secure connection with a site. Actually, when we visit, it's using elliptic curves um, to set up this secure connection. This is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman exchange. That's what it stands for. The DH is Diffie-Hellman. Um, so that sort of thing happens, and then you. But you know, the website load time will be less if the protocol is a little too slow. So there's a lot to worry about. Uh, but yeah. Okay, so let's talk about, did you have a further comment? Okay, let's talk about the man in the middle attack, and I'll come back to the discrete log problem. Okay, make this, I'll make this really big. Okay, man in the middle attack. Okay, so this is... A, an everyday annoyance with the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So, let's see. Are there any mints right between me and Matt? Yes. So, everything I say to Matt, you can hear, right? And everything Matt says back to me, um, you can also hear. But not only that, let's suppose that I... You, you get an... Ex What's your name again? Sam. Sam? Yeah. Sam, okay. Let's suppose that we set things up so that I think I'm talking to Matt, but I'm actually talking to you, okay? And then I say, uh, let's agree on this prime number P. Uh, when I compute my T, I get the following. T is blah, and I tell that to you. And then what you do is you just say, hmm, maybe I'll just spin my head around really quickly and say, Matt, T is blah. And then Matt thinks he's talking to me as well, but he's actually talking to you because you're just sitting there spinning your head around back and forth and catching all the traffic. Basically, if you can somehow intercept all the traffic between us and pass on new things, then uh, what you do, you end up doing is you negotiate a key with me and you also negotiate a key with Matt. And they're different keys because you don't actually know my secret. You can't say, you can't do it exactly, but you'll end up, wait, is that right? Do you negotiate different keys? Yes. So you negotiate different keys. So you, we set up a key exchange between the two of us and I think I'm negotiating with Matt, but I'm actually doing it with you. 
And then exactly the same moment, you have a really powerful computer, so you're, doing, you're very, very fast. So you're able to um, negotiate a key with me, and at the same time, you negotiate a key with Matt. And Matt and I think we're negotiating a key with each other, except we're actually negotiating with you. And then whenever we send secret messages, I send my message, I think it's going to Matt's. What you do is you take my message, you decrypt it, you re-encrypt it with the key for Matt, and then you send it on. So you basically you're sitting there in the middle, um, inter intercepting and redoing everything back and forth. So you need you know, to be really, really fast to do this. You need really, really good access to the underlying you know, internet net or whatever network infrastructure. So it's hard to imagine anyone could ever actually do this in practice. But of course they can. Um, so if you click on this link, how the NSA pulls off man-in-the-middle attacks. So you can read a little bit about exactly this happening. So to trick targets into visiting a Fox Acid server, the NSA relies on its secret partnership with U.S. telecom companies. As part of some thing, they uh, have computers placed at key places in the internet. Um, this ensures that they can react faster than other websites, e exploiting speed differences, impersonate a visited website before the legitimate site can respond, thereby tricking the target browser into visiting a Fox Acid server. So. It's not just like some theoretical worry. It's actually, it's used all the time. Um, when you think you're visiting one website, if you don't have something to, uh, if you don't have some sort of, so I mean what, kind of the, there's approaches to dealing with this problem, which is that you have a key, you have some sort of um, certificates that get assigned by some top level authorities. And they, they're, they prove that the website you're visiting really is the right one. So when I try to talk to Matt, what I do, is I first ask him for some proof that he's really Matt. And if he can't provide that proof, then I refuse the connection. So for example, I might go to the sagemathcloud.com website, and oops, dang it, redirected. Uh, oh, if I put HT, wow. I just, I had this set up with an invalid certificate on a fake site, so watch. Oops. Okay. Boom. Ah, okay. HTTPS con slash sagemathcloud.com. Boom. Okay. So that's a website I have set up, which uh, it's actually exactly the same as the cloud.sagemath site. The cloud.sagemath site has a little file in it, which proves that it's really the cloud.sagemath site, according to a third party authority, which is um, GoDaddy. Say. So GoDaddy, some DNS issuer also will issue certificates that say you're really who you are. And using a different crypto system that we'll talk about later, um, it's guaranteed that this site is the right site, as long as you believe the third party authority. Um, whereas this one, it gets that red there because it's actually, the proof isn't correct. It says, I'm cloud.sagemath.com, but in fact, it's not that. So the two don't match up. And so it gives me a big warning. Um, so some of the other, by the way, some of the other Snowden disclosures are about how to trick the, how to take over the third party site that's claiming that the um, site is who it really is. So that's another step that may be necessary in order to pull off this man in the middle attack. In any case, to understand the basic idea, it's just that if you have two people and you try to set up, you try to do everything with just Diffie Hellman, you'll run into this problem that somebody right in the middle can um, intercept everything encrypt and decrypt very quickly, and you're pretty much out of luck. Um, if you've ever used SSH, again, the command line program, you'll see very vividly the first time you ever connect to a computer, it asks you, are you sure this is really that computer, and gives you some little fingerprint, and then you say yes, and then it stores some information in a file in the um, uh, known host file, and then every time you connect in the future, it checks that that fingerprint is still the same, and if it changes due to a man in the middle attack, it gives you a warning message. It says, you know, text everywhere, this is a man in the middle attack, you may be under attack now, and then you ignore it, because that's what everybody does. <laughs> um, and then you, it also, nowadays it also gives you a command you can type to delete that um, warning easily, without having to edit this file directly. Okay, so that's the man in the middle attack, and it's something you have to worry about with many crypto systems. Another thing I want to tell you about is, in like two minutes, is just a little bit about the discrete log problem. So this is the problem of just straight up breaking the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. 
let's suppose you're watching what we do. We choose our prime key, we choose our secret numbers, we publish t and t prime, and now we agree on a secret. And you really, really want to know the secret. Like, you actually want to find that secret. So, what you know is the published information. You don't know m, you don't know n, but you really want to know m and n. You want to know 2 to the power of m n. One way you could solve this, as I mentioned before, that would take a very long amount of time, is you simply compute, you just simply try m equals 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., until you find that you get 2 to the m. Eventually you would. It would take hundreds, hundred, it would take a um, very, very, very long amount of time, but eventually you would get there, and then you would know m, and then you could compute 2 to the m n. Um, it turns out there are better algorithms for computing the m given 2 to the m and p. They're still really slow, but they're much, much faster than what I just described. And you might be curious, what, are the current, what is the current world record completely public attack that has succeeded on this? And the current um, record is, it's given right here, 530 bits. So the size of the prime that we showed in our example, that is too small. People have actually completely, in the outside world, no secrecy, no like secret government agency stuff, they have cracked the discrete log problem in specific instances they have solved this problem in specific instances where the prime had 530 bits in binary. And the one we looked at had only 512. So the size that we were working with is definitely not big enough if you're going to really deploy this. If you look at the RFC for, um, uh, I guess this is related to SSH, but for use of Diffie-Hellman on the internet, they say that you should use a P that has at least 1,024 bits and at most 8,192 bits. So that's the recommended minimum possible size of the prime. Okay. All right, we'll start next time with RSA, which will allow us to digitally sign documents, verify identities, and send encrypted messages. And this is something you want to understand well if you ever want to try to use encrypted email, for example. So the yeah. question on the new homework about residues or something, what is that? Or is it, it's like risk, Which question? Uh, I can't remember what number it is. Maybe three or four. Let me turn off these. Yeah. Uh, like there's a stop button up here somewhere. Seven, seven, seven.